but looking at ground source heat pumps, it's something that can be scaled from either an individual home use or to larger applications. And so that's why it really made sense for the two groups to partner together, not only on this lecture, but on the project that we will be sharing with you during the lecture. So I'm going to introduce uh, Jason Meyer. He is a research engineer with the Alaska Center for Energy and Power and uh, led the research effort. He's going to be introducing everybody else. I, I'd ask you to save your questions till the end. That'll help make sure that each speaker gets the appropriate amount of time to talk, and then we can address questions and get out of here in time for Adam to show his movie. So Jason, come on down. Thank you. How are you guys doing tonight? Um, as Julia said, uh, my name is Jason Meyer. I'm a research engineer with the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. I'm actually based in Anchorage, so I only come up to Fairbanks every now and then. So, What I wanted to do is uh, kick off our lecture by introducing the topic and introducing uh, our speakers. Uh, we actually have a couple people speaking tonight. Um, this project was really a large-scale group effort, um, and it really had its genesis um, with these very fundamental questions. Um, ground source heat pump technology is used widely in the lower 48, as many of you know. It's used for heating and cooling, but there's really limited application in cold climates. So the question for us was, what are these limits? And what, uh, what is currently being done in Alaska and other cold climates in particular? Partially because um, one of the, the very fundamental questions is that heating costs in Alaska are so high, and ground source heat pumps have a real opportunity of addressing these high heating costs. <coughs> this presentation is based out of uh, the report we put together for the Denali Commission, uh, Ground Source Heat Pumps in Cold Climates, the Current State of the Alaskan Industry, a review of the literature, a preliminary economic assessment, and recommendations for research. That's a mouthful. Um, it's funded by the Denali Commission. It's actually uh, due to be published on May 31st, so this is a bit of a preview of what is going to be coming out then. And as you can see, there are a lot of organizations involved in this, uh, from the Alaska Center of Energy Power, our partners over at Coal Climate Housing uh, Research Center, also the Alaska Energy Authority and the National Renewable Energy Lab partnered in on the study, providing experts, feedback, advice, peer review, uh, and technical review. This report is really a uh, first cut assessment looking at ground source heat pumps, both in cold climates and in Alaska. Uh, listed here are some of the questions that the report seeks to address, um, such as what are the challenges associated with cold, uh, cold climate applications of ground source heat pumps? Uh, what is being done in Alaska? What type of projects are out there? What research has been done? Um, what's the industry like in Alaska? Who's putting projects in? Is there an industry? Are there manufacturers and installers in the state? And then also trying to look at data, any data available from these systems, particularly trying to address some of the uh, limits to applying ground source heat pumps in cold climates. And then finally, we sought to do a preliminary economic assessment of ground source heat pumps in Alaska. So I wanted to give a uh, uh, outline of the presentation. We're going to start off with just a brief uh, review of ground source heat pump technology. And then we're going to discuss the Alaska industry and, and projects and installations around the state. We're going to look at uh, specific factors that you need to consider or think about in cold climates. Uh, we're going to discuss the uh, preliminary economic assessment that we performed. And then we're going to just discuss briefly some of the conclusions and uh, recommendations that came from this report. But we're trying to tailor it to this audience here. So um, at the end of the lecture, please feel free to ask us questions specific to your questions or needs. I wanted to introduce our research team. Uh, speaking first is going to be Colin Craven from Cold Climate Housing Research Center. He's their director of uh, product testing. And then uh, next is going to be Dominique Pride. Um, she's a, a researcher over at ASEP focusing on our economic assessment. And we also had two other researchers that uh, unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, Vanessa Spencer with Cold Climate Housing Research Center and then Jonathan O'Toole with ASEP. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Colin. Thanks, Jason. So I know we have a pretty varied audience. I know some of you out there know a lot about heat pumps. Uh, some of you probably know a little bit, and 
maybe some of you are just curious. So I'm going to give a little bit of an overview so we're all somewhat on the same page. So this is a bit of a busy graphic, but if I wanted to get across anything, capture just the circular nature of this process. Ground source heat pump is very different than using heating oil to heat your house or heat a building. It uh, doesn't burn a fuel. In fact, it uses electricity to move heat from one medium to another. So if we start from the left and work through this process, you have a low temperature source um, from the ground that's providing low temperature energy that can be concentrated by the heat pump. Concentrated by the heat pump into some kind of usable form for distribution into a building or your house. And this whole process happens as a cycle. And it might sound a little bit familiar because it's a very familiar technology. It's really just a refrigerator in reverse, if you will. It's a, it's a crude analogy, but it's a very mature technology. And really the novelness is the use in heating buildings, at least in cold climates like Alaska. So you can use this technology much like you would uh, probably like what you have in your homes, an oil-fired boiler or something like that to deliver space heat by air or by uh, radiant um, heating, like in-floor heating. And you can also get um, some or maybe all of your uh, domestic hot water from it. So it's pretty analogous to a uh, oil-fired boiler. Well, so where do we get this source of energy? Really depends on where your building or house is located. Um, most common around the Fairbanks area for installations that have gone in recently has been to dig a trench or a pit of some kind and use horizontal ground loops. This is a closed ground loop, so you're circulating a fluid into the ground that's buried, you know, somewhere around 8 or 12 feet under the surface. And you circulate it into the ground, capture whatever heat's available for the heat pump to use. If you happen to be lucky enough to live next to a, a lake of any size, which someone in town has done, you can use that instead as a heat source in a closed loop application. And you could use a vertical well system such has been used in Juno quite a bit, and that'll be shown a little later in the presentations. These are all examples of a closed loop system. There's a less common system called an open loop system where you actually extract water, um, extract, um, draw groundwater, extract heat from it, and then re-inject it. Why do we go to all this bother in dealing with the ground? Well, for one reason, it's the ground is much less variable in the temperatures than the air. So if you look at this example diagram we have here, on the horizontal axis we have the temperature, and you can see from the top, the range of air temperatures, now this, this chart's from southern Canada, considered cold climates by most people in America, but a bit warm for us. And you can see there's a broad range of air temperatures throughout the year, but as you start getting down into the ground, down the vertical axis, you can see that the range of temperatures draws in. It, it, it's much less variable as you go into the ground. So this presents a resource, if you will, much more stable temperature source for a heat pump to draw from than the air. When it's cold out, the last thing you want to be doing is trying to extract heat from the air. So if this diagram doesn't help you at all, here's another way of looking at it. Temperature on the vertical axis this time, and it's just winter to summer to winter. Just the seasonal variations at different depths in the ground. You get a little bit into the ground, not a whole lot of difference between being in the air. But as you start to get deeper, here's seven feet down, and at 16 feet down, for this location, the average annual ground temperature is pretty much what you get all year round. So another big difference between what we're used to seeing for heating our homes, something like an oil-fired appliance, versus heat pumps is the efficiency. And we're going to talk about that, so I wanted to set it up. What is the efficiency of a heat pump? Well, first, what do you have in your house now? Probably most of us have some kind of oil-fired boiler or furnace. And you're probably seeing numbers called AFUE, the annual fuel utilization efficiency. And you're used to hearing numbers about 70 to 90%. 70% is not so great. 90% you're doing pretty well. 
But for ground source heat pump, that's not really the way it works. You're not burning a fuel. Instead, we talk about in the, when you're using it for heating, we talk about a coefficient of performance. Some people call it COPE, some people call it COP. So we'll go with that. And that's really just a fraction. How much heat are you getting out of the unit delivered from the heat pump versus how much electricity do you draw um, to run the heat pump? And you're probably used to hearing numbers for that about two to four. So it's a really a very different metric than um, a conventional oil-fired system. Uh, one last thing before I hand it back over to Jason. Just wanted to emphasize one of the factors that he talked about in the beginning about, you know, this is a very mature technology in the lower 48 and even in southern Canada. Um, <clears throat> how different are we up here? Just as one sample across the United States, uh, the Department of Defense did an inventory a couple years ago at their facilities, you know, they're across the whole U.S. 21,000 heat pump units is what they had at their facilities. The vast majority of those are in the southeast where they're used um, primarily for cooling. The next big chunk was in the Midwest where it's used a bit for heating and cooling. None of those 21,000 units were in a cold climate. And obviously, the Department of Defense facilities is only so much of a sample, but I thought that was a very telling example of how rare heat pumps are here or in other cold climate locations relative to the rest of the lower 48. So with that in mind, Jason's going to talk to you a bit about what does exist um, in Alaska. Thanks, Colin. As I stated in the beginning, uh, this report was pretty extensive. We had a, a pretty broad uh, net in terms of uh, talking with installers, with homeowners, with experts, research experts, academics, uh, counterparts in Canada and other cold climates. Uh, so I just wanted to take a poll in the audience. Was anyone in the audience a homeowner that we interviewed or uh, talked to during this report? And or uh, anyone here own a ground source heat pump at their home? No hands. Is uh, Professor Zarling here? Professor Zarling? Okay. Uh, so there are maybe one or two people um, either involved or have experience with uh, ground source heat pumps. I wanted to talk a little bit about the industry in Alaska. Now this is definitely a very general overview. Um, our report goes into a lot of detail on this. What we did is uh, tried to uh, construct a detailed database of all known projects in Alaska, both on the commercial scale and the residential scale. Uh, interviewing those homeowners or those uh, facility managers, trying to discover uh, anything and everything about their system, what type it is, what type of uh, manufacturer supplied their heat pump, what's their reported COP, what's their entering water temperature, um, what are they seeing in terms of performance and cost, really trying to do a very thorough job of uh, going through all the systems currently in place in Alaska. Uh, we discovered uh, 49 residential systems. I think there's a bit more than this, but this were, these were all the ones that we could contact uh, and interview. Um, and they're really clustered in just uh, several key locations around the state, uh, primarily in the Matsu Valley, Fairbanks area, Juneau, um, Anchorage area, and then also Seward, and then uh, some other communities around the state. And there's primarily six commercial uh, scale systems. Uh, there might be one or two more, uh, but primarily the Alaska Sea Life Center, uh, the brand new one going in at the Juneau Airport, uh, the Diamond Park Aquatic Center in Juneau, ALMP Office Building also in Juneau, Weller Elementary School here in Fairbanks, and then the NOAA Ock Bay Laboratories outside of Juneau. Going through our uh, systems, doing this interview process with the homeowners, in some cases going to site, looking at the systems, looking at some of the performance information, um, we noticed a couple trends. Um, primarily, I think there's only maybe one or two out of all the uh, systems that are not horizontal. So a majority of the systems are horizontal ground loops. And there's a COP range from 2.2 to 3.98. Admittedly, there's not very many that have any type of data associated with the systems. Um, but those that did, uh, this was the typical range of the COP. 
What was really interesting was discussing reasons for installation with the homeowners. Why they chose to install these systems? Was it based on economics or um, you know, wanting to insulate against variable diesel fuel costs, et cetera? Um, and it was interesting that each reported that uh, long-term cost savings was one of the strong or primary motivators for installing the systems. In addition, many uh, were very interested in that it was a renewable energy or partially renewable energy. And furthermore, what was really striking, uh, all owners interviewed reported satisfaction with their systems. Uh, also, admittedly, there might be a couple out there that didn't work or didn't function, but they just didn't get back to us. So it might have been a self-selection in terms of people interested in speaking. I wanted to talk a little bit about the installers in the state. Who are these installers? Who's putting in systems, installing systems? It's a really small community. Uh, in fact, there's only 13 businesses who, who primarily do in, uh, ground source heat pump installations around the state, but really it's more like six or seven. And in addition, there's a couple individuals, homeowners that have systems, people that are experts that help out with their neighbors or people word of mouth uh, installing these systems. And really, these installers are primarily based in these uh, five or six, seven communities. What's really interesting is all the installers state that the high capital cost, the upfront capital cost of these systems are a barrier to uh, installation, both on the residential and the commercial scale. And finally, in terms of uh, commercial scale systems, there's, there's only a few engineering firms that are actually involved previously or currently in designing and installing systems. And really, there's limited experience in the state. There's only seven systems. Um, so there's really not a lot of Alaska institutional experience in terms of installing ground source heat pumps. Uh, a little bit about the manufacturers. Um, some manufacturers do have products that are targeted for cold climates. Um, and if you talk with reps, they'll say, yes, we have this new technology. It's really well tailored for colder climates. Majority of uh, manufacturers, their products are really targeted for these uh, lower 48 climates, as Colin mentioned, uh, you know, heating slash cooling loads. And none of them are located in the state. They might have regional reps or vendors, but there's no manufacturer based in the state with offices here. Um, and it's something you have to consider when working with ground source heat pumps. Your supply chain is distant. So if there's any repairs, orders, special issues, uh, your support network is not locally based. Um, also of note, uh, not that we're promoting these, but these were uh, Water Furnace and Econar were the primary residential scale system uh, uh, manufacturers. It could be just a product of the installers, those are their vendors, but it was pretty striking that a majority of the system were from those two vendors in particular. Um, yes, uh, well I think on the residential system for sure, um, probably not on the commercial scale. I think the commercial scale was a little varied, but there's only six systems. Um, a little bit about the drilling industry, and this is pretty interesting. So drilling uh, industry is specific to vertical uh, well systems. As Colin mentioned, you have horizontal systems, and then you have uh, vertical systems, and vertical systems need drilling. Uh, drilling costs in Alaska are very high, um, and it's typical that they cannot uh, compete with horizontal systems. And that's reflected in the residential scale systems uh, where 47 of the 49 systems were actually horizontal systems. And the ones that were vertical were probably uh, uh, either test sites with uh, the university or other uh, slightly different scenarios. These high costs are due to a combination of factors, primarily ground conditions, uh, limited competition in the state, and then limited uh, availability of equipment. Uh, just as an example, in speaking with the uh, project manager for the Juno Airport, um, they were facing uh, rig costs of $20 per foot uh, plus mobilization fees for doing their project there, um, compared to costs in Seattle, which were $8 per, per foot. And in fact, uh, the Juno Airport project contracted with a rig in Seattle, barged it up, drilled all 108 of their wells, and shipped it back 
um, at a cost that was much, much lower than just drilling even uh, uh, their test wells uh, using local contractors. So, And in addition, they also mentioned the experience in drilling. Um, they were a lot more comfortable working with a driller that had done a lot of ground source heat pump systems. Uh, so they also factored that in. Yeah, that's a good question. In fact, uh, there are a couple of drilling uh, companies in the state that primarily do water wells, um, but they will also do ground source heat pump wells as well. Um, I think, uh, yep, yeah, uh, very similar. I wanted to go through just a couple of the commercial scale systems, uh, show you guys some photos, discuss these systems. Um, uh, the first one I wanted to discuss was the Weller Elementary School in Fairbanks. And what you see here is the actual uh, installation of the horizontal ground loop. So just as a visual, this is what that looks like when you're uh, digging a trench and installing your uh, ground loop into the ground. Uh, this system is going to be primarily used for preheating of the air supply um, for the building. And it's a little unique in that it also incorporates a solar thermal system, uh, trying to target a hybridized system. The uh, solar thermal system is looking to supplement heat in the summer and then, uh, I believe, heat up the actual ground loop in the winter. And the uh, water, it's a water to air uh, heat pump is the primary heat pump there. Here's some other installation photos. So again, the horizontal uh, loop installation. And this is what the actual piping looks like. It's uh, in a kind of a coiled configuration, probably to increase surface area. I believe they call this a slinky. And this is uh, the solar ther thermal system on the roof there. Just some other figures. And this is the actual unit's interior to the building. Uh, the next project I wanted to just briefly discuss was the Alaska Sea Life Center in Seward. Uh, this project is currently under construction as we speak. It's due to be commissioned uh, at the beginning of June. And this is a, another unique application, but actually looking to use the Resurrection Bay seawater source as their, uh, as their ground loop. Um, fortunately, they, uh, as being an aquarium, they have uh, very large uh, intake pipes already installed in their facility. So um, it was a real natural fit for them to already use this existing infrastructure in this type of heat pump. They're looking to use space heating and then perhaps in the future looking at sidewalk uh, heating as well. It's an open loop sy system um, and it's, uh, it's pretty large. It, they're two 90 ton systems. Um, and I wanted to show this graphic of the seawater temperatures in Resurrection Bay, just building off of what Colin was talking about in terms of uh, inlet temperatures. So this is a graph of uh, uh, maximum monthly and minimum monthly and average uh, seawater temperature in Resurrection Bay. So you see it oscillates uh, between a high of just over 56 degrees to probably down around 37 here. And this is the medium uh, area that they're targeting. And what's really interesting is if you look at the months, um, it's uh, the high months actually come a little later than you would expect. And partially it's because Resurrection Bay is building up its heat storing it and then it dissipates it later. So it's kind of a lag effect in terms of the heat available from Resurrection Bay. The next system, uh, Diamond Park Aquatic Center in Juneau, and this is also open to, uh, due to be opened, I believe, June 4th. It's their uh, grand commissioning. Um, so it's really interesting, uh, I believe, Someone associated with the project mentioned that they didn't really un know of any other ground source heat pumps used to heat uh, pools or wa bodies of water. But uh, in fact, that's not true. I, <laughs> I was just uh, speaking with my uh, grandpa actually right before the lecture. And I think back in the 60s, he installed one of these systems on a, 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 a hotel swimming pool. So I thought that was, it, it was it's uh, not a new technology or uh, application. Um, again, they're using it for pool heating and also space heating, uh, using a water to water and then also water to air uh, heat pumps. Um, it's a vertical loop with 164 wells. Finally, I wanted to just mention briefly about the Juneau International Airport Terminal. Um, this one is also due to uh, be commissioned shortly. This is in conjunction with their retrofit of the building there. It's also a vertical system consisting of 108 wells. 
primarily used for space heating um, with some uh, uh, sidewalk ice melt. Um, it's water to air and then also water to water heat pumps. Um, I think what's an interesting uh, relationship is that the expected maintenance cost for this system is actually higher than their conventional system, uh, partially due to the um, hiring of uh, specialized maintenance personnel for the system. Uh, I thought that was an interesting point. But um, the uh, expected savings, operational savings, and also energy savings uh, uh, offset that increased maintenance cost. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Colin to discuss some cold climate considerations, followed by Dominique discussing our economic assessment. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about the context we were saying before about the lower 48 and how are we different here and how are these applications that Jason was just talking about, uh, what are the challenges you'd have in designing those? Well, going back to this figure we talked about before um, for this example in a, the warmer end of a cold climate location, you can see with an average soil temperature around 50 degrees, they're already starting off at a relatively warm temperature. That's one advantage. It's a higher grade resource, if you will. Um, for these kind of applications, you typically have some heating and cooling. Heating means heat extraction from the ground. Cooling means heat rejection. Uh, it helps to balance the soil temperature a bit. And lastly, just in a lesser cold climate, if you will, I'm not trying to speak down of them, the winters aren't as cold, so you're not drawing heat from the ground as much, uh, thus you're not, you know, in danger of drawing down your resource, if you will. So conversely, we have some disadvantages here. Uh, we have lower average ground temperatures. Uh, an analogous figure here showing for Anchorage, being the tropics, Fairbanks being kind of cold, right around freezing for our average um, soil temperature, and Barrow being quite cold. And we only typically, especially for residences, use heat pumps for heat extraction. So we're only drawing heat from the ground and leaving the recharge to Mother Nature, if you will. And lastly, we have extremely long winters, long, prolonged uh, periods of drawing heat from the ground. So that's potentially a disadvantage as well. So what does this really mean? Why, does that, why is that significant? Well, the colder the ground, the lesser the efficiency of the heat pump because you're having to lift the temperature from the inlet from the ground to what you want it to be to heat your building. And the, the taller that lift, the less efficient the whole process. Um, and it, as Jason mentioned in terms of the actual products available, only some of them are made targeted for cold climates. So unless you have the right heat pump, you could even run into the low end of your operational limit of a heat pump. In fact, even the ones designed for cold climates tend to be operating towards the lower end for the kind of soil temperatures we're talking about for Alaska. Um, well, does that make you curious about what you should expect for a heat pump if you're considering one? Uh, if you're already looking at some, the manufacturers provide some specs for inlet temperatures, which is roughly a reflection of what the ground temperatures are, um, what kind of COP or efficiencies we talked about before to expect. And this is just drawing on one example of a system that's described as a cold climate heat pump. Our efficiency or COP is on the vertical axis and the entering water temperature, again, roughly analogous to what the soil temperature would be. You can see it ranges anywhere from around two and a half to almost four. And we're down towards the lower end. Uh, this is a pretty huge variation. So it matters significantly where you are on that. Now that's just a rough estimate because that's from data from providing standard temperatures and your specific application wherever you are is going to vary quite a bit. So what we found in a pretty big uh, review of the literature from over the last several decades for heat pumps everywhere from Juneau uh, to Fairbanks, we found roughly that range of heat pumps performing between a COP of two to almost four. The thing was really interesting about that though, it wasn't that the ones in the warmer locations, if you will, performed better and the ones in the colder performed worse. It was, it was rather scattered. And all these studies tend to be on relatively short time span. 
and projects are typically funded for a year or two. So that's the data you have. So there are other risks. Are you going to create a massive sheet of ice in your backyard? Are you going to grow permafrost, if you will, if you put this in your backyard? A lot of people have asked that question, and it's, it's, it's actually a legitimate question. There is no doubt that you can, with mechanical equipment, freeze ground, keep it frozen, or even increase the you know, seasonal frost or even permafrost. But the evidence for that happening when you design a system to be used for heating your, your building or your home is pretty scarce. You know, if you go one way or the other, it's not shown to be um, definitively the case, and it hasn't shown that you, know, you can ignore it either. But I really, I think the crucial question we're getting towards on this is with the, all this presentation we're giving to you about the heat pump is, is this a cheaper option for you in uh, Fairbanks for heating oil or uh, Anchorage for natural gas? So with that in mind, I'll hand it over to Dominique and she's going to tell you quite a bit about just that. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our preliminary economic assessment and hopefully not bore you to death. <laughs> um, first off, the design of our assessment. We picked five population centers all over the state of Alaska. And some of these actually have ground source, ground source heat pumps installed in Bethel, but Bethel does not. We were just interested to see if somewhere in that area of the state how the economics would work out. Um, it's important to emphasize that all these were assuming a new construction. So if you wanted to retrofit your home for a ground source heat pump, the economics would be very different. It would actually cost a lot more than if you were just building, or if it was a new, a new build. So we found the average size home and the average annual heating or space heating requirement per square foot. We got those from a report that was uh, Information Insights Alaska um, the Alaska heating, or something like that. Um, <laughs> we compared uh, the typical home heating systems for each uh, area. For example, Anchorage would use natural gas, whereas nowhere else in the state of the five cities would, uh, would use natural gas. But uh, oil-fired boilers, electric resistance, and then a Toyo stove for Bethel. So uh, all capital costs are based on installer estimates. This is really important because this is a preliminary economic assessment. There aren't a whole lot of ground source heat pumps at, in residential homes or residential areas. Uh, there's about 50, so there's only a few. And for each city, we got one estimate per city for an installation of this prototype house. So this isn't based on like a big data set. These, this is a very preliminary assessment. For our energy prices, we got our uh, fuel oil prices from the uh, Institute for Social and Economic Research down in Anchorage. They uh, published the Alaska fuel price projections. They do that about every six months. And we used the uh, July 2010 version, except we took the carbon pricing out. We used their prices, the mid-range case, uh, minus the carbon pricing because we do not have a carbon tax. So we didn't see the sense of putting that in there just yet. All electricity prices are from the local utilities in the cities, except for Bethel, and we use the power cost equalization report to get the electricity price. And our natural gas price came from NSTAR. Um, we assume that each home only uses a single heating system for its entire demand. And I realize that a lot of people use secondary systems like wood, but that would have gotten really complicated in trying to figure out what percentage to assign to the ground source heat pump and then what percentage to assign to a secondary heating system. So for this preliminary assessment, we just assumed that a single source was used for the entire demand. And then we converted BTUs to kilowatt hours for ease of comparison between all systems. Um, our main metric that we use is net present value. A lot of people would assume that we would want to use simple payback, but there was a few reasons that I chose not to use that. And that is because I wanted to use escalating fuel costs, and it's easier to do that with a net present value. And also, we can account for inflation with uh, the, the net present value, whereas if you use a simple payback, you really can't account for inflation. And also, we were comparing multiple heating systems within each 
population center. And so we would have to do a simple payback for every single system. So it would have gotten pretty complicated. We assume that each system has a 15 year lifespan and some of the systems that we uh, chose to assess had maybe a slightly lower or a slightly higher, but we used a, a basket of systems, like a portfolio, so we decided a 15 year lifespan was a, a mid range. Um, we used a 3% discount rate in our net present value. And uh, for our escalating fuel costs, we used ICER's mid-range for oil prices. And then for all utilities, we used a 5.4% annual increase. And that came from the Energy Information Administration's uh, Electric Power Monthly from 2003 to 2009. And that's the earliest year residential rates in Alaska were available is 2003. And we also assumed a 3% uh, annual increase for maintenance costs. So, okay, uh, for Juno, the average size home is about 1,700 square feet. And you'll notice that uh, sewer and Juno have the same, same numbers, and that's because the energy, in, or or the energy Insights Report, Information Insights Report, had specific numbers for Anchorage and Fairbanks, and then Juno and Seward were for um, other urban areas, which included communities in the southeast, and then Bethel was considered a, a rural hub. So that's where these numbers came from. And we got the average home size and how much uh, per square foot each home uses annually, and then the heating degree days. And as to be expected, uh, Bethel and Fairbanks are colder, so they're going to have more heating degree days. For system efficiencies, how efficient your system will definitely impact your energy, annual energy costs. So for uh, the ground source heat pumps, we found in the subarctic climates through our literature review that uh, the systems typically have about a, a 2.5 to 3 for the coefficient of performance. And then for electric resistance, these are like the baseboard heaters. They are 99% efficient. And uh, for oil fire boilers, there's a lot of variation within oil fire boilers, so you're going to get about 80 to 90% efficiency. Um, the direct vent heater, really, this is a Toyo stove. There's not really any other stoves in the market for that, and they have an 87% efficiency. And then your natural gas furnaces down in Anchorage are going to have about uh, 78 to 97 percent efficiency. And these efficiency bands are where our energy cost bands come from. Um, systems that have higher efficiencies obviously will have lower annual energy costs. So our results, um, Juno for the ground source heat pump, you'll see it has a, a high capital cost and a lower annual energy cost than the other systems. For electric resistance, because electricity in Alaska is so high, they, the electric resistance typically had the highest cost for any of the systems that we assessed. And normally, you wouldn't heat your whole house with, a base, with baseboard heaters. It would be a secondary heating source. So for our net present values, the system that would, uh, would, that would be best is the one that is going to have the lowest net present value because this is uh, cost outlays over a 15 year period. Oh, one other thing is the maintenance. We assumed a zero percent ma or a zero uh, maintenance cost for electric resistance heaters because they're so low cost that if one broke, it would be cheaper just to replace it than to have somebody come repair it. And all of these estimates came from local installers. And it's uh, the same with the maintenance costs. So for Anchorage, you'll notice that the capital cost is much higher in Anchorage than it was for Juno, And that is because the installer that we surveyed or interviewed in Anchorage did not own his own excavation equipment. And that's going to make a big difference in the installation cost. If the, the person that's installing it owns their own excavation equipment, they don't have to rent it. And that will save the, the person getting it installed a lot of money. So for uh, Anchorage, actually natural gas furnaces were the lowest cost option over the 15 year period. In Fairbanks, 
Um, the system, like I said, was the estimate's lower, and that's because the, the person that we got the estimate from owns his own excavation equipment. And uh, the ground source heat pumps are pretty comparable with an oil fire boiler over 15, a 15-year 15 period. In Bethel, this was a hypothetical system. There's no system in Bethel. But we were interested to see, you know, would these work out in Bethel? And it didn't work out so well. And the reason for that is Bethel ha is a power cost equalization community. And so they get the first 500 hours of uh, electricity that they use at a lower rate. Than and then any consumption beyond 500 hours is there's a big uh, jump in price. It's actually 54 cents after the first 500 kilowatt hours. So that means that electricity in Bethel is much more expensive than it is in other parts of the state after they have gone over their allotment of PCE hours. And um, the biggest th is the electric resistance heat that nobody would ever heat their house <laughs> in Bethel with uh, baseboard heaters. It would actually cost them a fortune annually. Um, for Seward, Seward's in the southeast, and we noticed that communities that have uh, cheaper electricity but, have the, but incur the high uh, fuel oil costs like we do here in Alaska, that these systems work out best there. So for um, Seward, the ground source heat pump was pretty comparable also to the, to the oil-fired boiler over the 15-year period. So a picture's worth a thousand words. <laughs> All those results are depicted here in this picture. And you can see that for all of the cities that the ground source heat pumps have a pretty high capital cost, actually higher than any of the other systems. But the other costs, the uh, operating costs and the, um, the operating costs are actually comparable or lower than the other systems. And this right here is the electric resistance heater in Juneau. We actually had to truncate the axes because the number was so high. <laughs> but this just shows you uh, the ground source heat pumps versus the other traditional systems used in those communities. There are rebates available to uh, homeowners that want to install this technology. And one of the, there's a several from the state and from the federal government, but the, the biggest one is there's a 30% rebate from the federal government. And we wanted to look at how that would affect the household economics. And we can't just say it's net present value because somebody is incurring those costs. It's the government that's incurring the cost. So it's not really gonna change the, the overall net present value, but it will change the household economics of it. And uh, the, the, the rebate is going to uh, lower the barriers to the technology implementation. And it does make a pretty big difference if you get a 30% rebate on your capital and installation cost. You can see that it really brings down the price of the, um, of the system over the 15-year period. So for the comments, this is a very preliminary assessment. And as more systems are installed, we'll get a much better idea of how much these, uh, how much the, the capital costs really are for different sized homes within the state. Um, for our results, we found that uh, in Fairbanks, Juneau, and Seward, that these systems are comparable to oil-fired boilers over a 15-year period. And they appear to be most economically feasible in areas with cheaper electricity but high fuel oil prices. Um, and anybody that's interested in installing one of these in their home, they should really uh, check into the, the, their own energy costs and the capital costs of the system that would be appropriate for their own home because the, the soil conditions on your land will also impact the cost. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thanks, Dominique. So uh, we're going to wrap up the presentation here, going over some of our conclusions, and finally just a couple of research recommendations, primarily from our report. Um, and then from there, we'll go into questions um, from the audience. And I actually, might actually have uh, Dominique and Colin uh, come up and help address any uh, questions as well. So uh, the first uh, primary, and these are all very general, uh, 
conclusions, as you can see, um, there's a lot more discussion and in-depth analysis within the report, uh, but a little too detailed for um, a comprehensive uh, presentation tonight. Um, so the first uh, finding technically and finan uh, financially feasible cold climate ground source heat pumps have been widely reported. Um, What's interesting is through the academic literature, uh, both in Alaska, Canada, and throughout Scandinavia, other cold climates, um, a number of uh, studies have indicated that um, these have been uh, technically successful um, in cold climates. And then uh, the uh, 2 to 3.5 range of COP, as we mentioned, was uh, the uh, typical uh, band, and that's what we used uh, throughout our report. Uh, what's interesting is a Canadian survey um, uh, looked at various ground source heat pump users throughout, um, I believe it was a specific province um, or maybe the entire country, um, and 95% of ground source heat pump owners actually recommended um, their use. So they were happy, they were satisfied, no catastrophic issues, uh, deterrence, et cetera. One of the important findings, and this is true of all ground source heat pumps, but particularly in cold climates, is that design is paramount for meeting performance expectations. Uh, another uh, uh, study, uh, I believe this is also from Canada, um, a common error in colder climates is to make the ground loop small and the heat pump large, which results in increased electrical use and decreased efficiency. And this really speaks to appropriately sizing both the ground loop and the heat pump on the other end, both avoiding inefficiencies, uh, higher capital costs than necessary, and also issues of thermal balances, freezing, creating permafrost, et cetera. Um, it, oh, this is the Canadian study, in fact, confirmed this, that a majority of homeowner issues were a result of improperly or improperly designed uh, systems. Um, and then finally, uh, the COP, as Colin mentioned, is uh, very dependent on the uh, design of the system. So an appropriately designed system will give you uh, an appropriate COP. And any uh, um, change in that COP can have uh, dramatic effects on both your performance and your economics. Uh, ground source heat pump systems giving regional considerations are economically viable heating systems. There's been a lot of an uh, anecdotal uh, comments on this prior to this study, um, especially from a the Alaska Energy Authority in particular, um, uh, talking about this relationship that Dominique described, uh, ground source heat pump systems being most applicable to systems with relatively cheaper electricity versus heating costs. Um, and then also this uh, anecdotal uh, information that these systems would be inappropriate for rural Alaska. We primarily looked at it along a, an economics perspective. We didn't look into um, the technical aspects, local capacity of installing, et cetera, but just based on uh, most of these communities being dependent on diesel fuel for electricity generation, these systems do not make economic sense. Uh, and then finally, uh, despite higher capital costs, and those capital costs of ground source heat pumps up front are substantial compared to the other systems. Um, despite those higher costs, um, through the economic assessment we uh, uh, did, these systems are comparable in communities like Fairbanks and, and in particular communities like Seward and Juneau, southeast Alaska, where you have this relationship between electricity and diesel heating oil. Uh, this is uh, probably one of the more obvious findings, but uh, again, really reasserted by this study, even going through all the systems in place, all the literature in Alaska, outside of Alaska, there's just really no long-term uh, information out there on these systems, really no long-term studies looking at performance over time. Is there any degradation of COP, any degradation or issues with the resource? Um, there just are not the studies available. Uh, what's interesting is the U.S. Department of Defense uh, 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 is also interested and makes this point that um, they really need more long-term studies to further understand ground source heat pumps uh, in terms of applying them to their facilities. Uh, a lot of the homeowners, um, or actually a few homeowners uh, interviewed, um, have had systems in place for a lengthy amount of time. 
Um, in fact, uh, through our database, uh, some of these systems have been installed uh, as early as the 60s, 70s, I believe, um, I think, maybe the 80s, early 80s. So some of these systems are very long standing, have been in place for a long time. Another point, um, hybrid te technology may improve performance of cold climate ground source heat pumps. And this is really what the Weller Elementary School project is looking at, uh, looking at integrating solar thermal energy um, to see how it uh, improves performance or affects the long-term uh, uh, performance of the system. Cold climate housing is actually in, uh, working with the Fairbanks North Star Borough uh, to instrument uh, and monitor this system. So at least we'll have one system with uh, long-term uh, data and information available. Uh, there's been other studies uh, interested in supporting this uh, assertion, uh, specifically in China um, and other locations. And hybrid systems uh, primarily refers to uh, solar thermal integration. This seems to be one of the primary uh, opportunities of hybridization. Uh, what's important to note, even though it might perf uh, increase performance, it does not increase economics or probably does not increase economics. Um, in fact, the more technology you integrate, the more expensive the upfront capital costs are, and perhaps the longer your payback period is. Um, this is uh, back to Colin's point about uh, thermal imbalances. Um, this is an issue in cold climates, and again, there's just not enough information long term to really um, address or understand this. Uh, a ground loop by nature will extract heat from the source. Finally, I wanted to close with just a couple of research recommendations we made uh, from this report. Um, our preliminary economic assessment was primarily to understand some of these fundamental dynamics between ground source heat pumps and other heating systems and other fundamental economic factors of ground source heat pumps. Um, and as such, we uh, made the assumption of new build construction to really be able to compare apples to apples. Um, the next uh, step would really to look, be to look at retrofit systems. Um, in fact, a majority of uh, new uh, 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 systems installed perhaps would be retrofit systems. Homeowners with existing heating systems looking to supplement or change up what they have in place. Um, but those economics are vastly different than new build construction. You're looking at uh, retrofit costs, installing uh, uh, radiant floor heating or, or other issues with your home. Uh, and also, there's uh, since there is so few projects and installers and such a limited market in the state, uh, the capital costs and uh, maintenance costs and operation costs are really preliminary. Um, they're not exact. They're not well known. It's not a well established market. So over time, it's really important to understand those. How are those um, really playing out in installations? Collecting that information from homeowners and installers. Um, the state. Uh, the state is put out a couple documents recently looking at strategic energy planning, the energy, uh, the Alaska Energy Plan, the energy pathway, um, and we really feel that ground source heat pumps need to be reintroduced or um, evaluated into that mix again, uh, particularly looking at uh, targets. If 50% uh, renewables by 2025 or whatever the target is, um, how can or will ground source heat pumps factor into that those targets? Um, We've mentioned a couple times the more positive economics in Southeast Alaska, given uh, cheaper electricity, higher heating costs, relatively speaking. Um, but they are uh, small grids. Um, these aren't large rail belt grids or uh, large grids like in the lower 48. So uh, widespread deployment of ground source heat pumps is not necessarily understood the ramifications of what that would have on local grids. Um, Another factor, air source heat pumps, we did not consider in our study um, due to their, um, they're just not applicable or um, there's a lot, of a lot more challenges with applying these to very cold climates. But that's not true across the state. Um, these might very well be uh, opportunities in Southeast Alaska, for instance. What doesn't make sense above the Arctic Circle might make sense in uh, some of the southern areas of Alaska. 
Um, again, just uh, long-term information from these systems. Um, what are we learning about uh, ground temperatures, uh, COP values over time? Um, these are really important to understand to be able to make concrete recommendations or even strategic planning on the homeowner level. And then again, uh, investigating this uh, hybridization, so carrying out this work at like Weller Elementary and perhaps other systems, looking at how does hybridization play into uh, deploying ground source heat pumps in cold climates. So with that. Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, the Sea Life Center uh, in Seward is uh, extracting heat from Resurrection Bay. Juno Airport's close to the ocean, but they're extracting it from the ground. Did they consider uh, sea-based sea uh, uh, ground loop? Um, I'm not 100% sure on their uh, analysis. What I do know is that the infrastructure costs are very high uh, for uh, seawater uh, extraction. Um, the Sea Life Center just happened uh, in their nature as an aquarium to have very, very large uh, seawater intake uh, pipes that extend a quarter mile out into Resurrection Bay, very costly, um, as well as uh, very large uh, seawater pumps. Um, and it's a uh, very, very expensive infrastructure. Um, so uh, my guess would be that that would economically would not be an option for the Juno Airport or other um, smaller commercial scale systems. Um, there's other facilities. The NOAA Ock Bay Laboratory uh, outside of Juno is actually also a seawater bay system, but they're also an aquarium. So um, it, uh, I think it's a factor of having that very expensive infrastructure in place. What, what's really interesting is looking beyond just a facility utilization of seawater um, but perhaps looking at district heating, it's something that's actually used in like Scandinavia and Norway. So actually using uh, seawater to heat district loops for uh, communities, towns, even cities. Um, something that uh, Seward in particular might have a great opportunity in the future. Yes, sir. Yeah, good question. Do you want to address it? Uh, the question was, what type of liquid do you use in the ground loop coil system? Um, you have a number of choices. The most common ones that we documented were a mixture of methanol and water or a glycol and water, such as ethylene or propylene glycol. I guess there's other options that don't tend to be typically used, like potassium acetate. Um, and they're mentioned in general literature on heat pumps, but we haven't documented any use of uh, any in this report for the database that Jason was talking about. So sorry, the question was, what fluids do you use in the ground loop um, for no matter how you put it in the ground? You have to have a fluid that's not just water. You don't want it freezing if it gets to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, how, do you, um, how do you make it antifreeze, so to speak? I guess while I have my short time in the mic, I'd just like to say that um, I've noticed that there are several people here that have been integral to many of these projects. Dr. Zarling in back was actually the main person. When we did the literature review, that was pretty much read his papers because he'd studied. Uh, he, he did most of the work in Alaska. And Robin, our engineer, Cold Climate Housing is the audience too. She's the one that's made the Weller School Project tick on our end. So she deserves a lot of credit for that. I think I saw Andy. Roe, one of the local installers here as well, he's been very helpful um, in giving us information for the kind of figures we've been showing you tonight. So really appreciate all their help. Yes, sir. My question that I would like to have answered is how scary
Yeah, that's that's a good uh, question comment. So uh, the question comment being, uh, what about the scalability of these systems? So a lot of our assumptions throughout the economic analysis looks at uh, standard, typical uh, Alaska energy use, uh, home size. But what about homes that are uh, more energy efficient? What about conservation, net zero energy homes, if I'm summarizing correctly? And I think that's a good question. Um, one of the considerations, perhaps, is um, ground source heat pumps have high capital costs, um, which if one was uh, making their choice based on uh, just payback period or other considerations, if uh, their energy demand is a lot less, perhaps that pay period might be extended out in the future. Um, that's one consideration. Um, but in fact, a lot of the people that installed these systems were uh, very conscious about that uh, element, looking at perhaps a renewable energy system, uh, something to shelter them from uh, fossil fuel. But overall, yeah, I think it's a good uh, question comment. So. Right, yeah. Right. Do you have any additional questions? I guess I'd say one quick thing. Yeah. Yeah, Rich, like, like Jason said, I think you have a really good point. And I think that's something that would be interesting to maybe think about where do we take this? Because I think one of the main points we wanted to get across with this was meeting people where they were at. And as we know, we, our homes are what they are. I mean, the kind of systems we're talking about. Um, um, would work for a retrofit. Um, and there's always the benefits to be having to lowering your heating demand. In fact, I would advocate you should think of that before you think about replacing your heating system. It'd be a shame to replace your heating system and then super insulate and have a brand spanking new oversized heating system. So, uh, we, true, we did kind of look at this in isolation, but at least speaking for CCHRC, the kind of questions we had from people coming in the door or people that would be looking at a four or five ton heating system, which is equivalent roughly to what you'd have for an oil fired system of burning a fraction or close to a gallon per hour of heating oil. So that's, that's where we had it. And um, I think you have a good point for where we could take it in the future now that we've asked or we answered some of the very basic questions. And just to expand on a point Colin made, um, Given in a retrofit situation the high capital costs of these systems, that money spent on things like energy efficiency upgrades, other improvements to the home might very well be better served and uh, in the long run serve you better than bringing in a very expensive uh, system. So, uh, yeah, I think at the back, yeah, sir. Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the question is, do you have any anecdotal or academic or scientific uh, information on systems performing at long stretches at very cold temperatures, 40 below? Um, not that I'm aware of, unless. Not directly. Yeah, not directly. Um, we have, uh, in our report, we actually have, uh, one of the only systems that we have substantial data from is a ha uh, science house based in Minnesota. Um, and that's been in place for 10 years, seven years, 10 years. Um, obviously not as cold as Fairbanks or f even further north, um, but uh, there was no degradation over time for that system. Um, the location is, it's a lot different. I don't think it's a permafrost location. It's next to a river, um, but uh, at least some systems have not shown that degradation. Yes. Yeah, Weller, I believe, is on. Uh, the question is, where is Weller in the system? Uh, Weller Elementary is on the chain. Not, not where is it located, but okay. How far along are they? You know, how many, how many data do they have? Uh, yeah, good. Robin, come on. Yeah, Robin, would you like to talk about that system a little bit? <laughs> no, no, you have to come up here. Yeah.
So um, Weller is almost complete. We haven't finished the installation of the heat pump. Actually, tomorrow we're going to go out and install the, uh, the glycol in the heat pump loop itself. The first year we're going to run it without the solar recharge. We are going to just, we just want a year of data seeing what the heat pump does to the ground. And then starting next spring, about this time, we'll run the, uh, we'll put glycol into the solar panels and run solar recharge into the ground. So hopefully by the end of this month it will be commissioned and running. And next year at this time we'll have data. <laughs> Okay, he, he, his, the question was how does the solar thermal element integrate into the system? And the, the Weller system is actually, it's a residential size heat pump. It's a five ton system. And it is only heating the makeup air for the building. The, um, the ground loop, it's, uh, it's a horizontal ground loop. It's got, I'm gonna get this wrong, is Andy here? I think it's got 6,000 feet of piping in the, in the ground loop. The, uh, there are six solar thermal panels on the building. It has a great south-facing wall on the roof. Um, the solar thermal actually will heat, actually will pump hot water, hot glycol directly into the ground loop. It'll come back from the ground loop and then into the heat pump. The school district is talking about in the future also using that solar thermal to uh, heat domestic hot water at some point, but that's many years in the future, most likely. Question for Robin. The trench size? There were, there were six linear trenches in that, in that install. I'm thinking they were 120 feet long. I'm not positive. Yep. Mm -hmm. Actually, those are, those are varying. They're, they're 12 and 8 feet deep in Weller. So I, I guess for the completeness of the document over there I see Marcus working busily the question was more or less about have we looked into um, ground storage of solar energy for use in, in a kind of system like this with a heat pump and um, we haven't ourselves directly done that there's what Rich was talking about is a local builder Thorsten Chaloup has done a couple of homes now where he's integrated large um, uh, well, not, not the ground, but uh, large water tank storage of water of, for thermal storage where you, through a solar thermal system, uh, store that up for use um, in the winter. 
I think he's already starting to look beyond that to along the lines of what you're talking about. But um, I think it's a very interesting area. Uh, we should look into it more. I think it's a good suggestion, Tom. And uh, if anyone's really interested in what Thorsten's done, I think he's still here. So I'd recommend you corner him when this, when this is all done and talk to him about what he's done. Yeah, yeah, is uh, Andy Rowe present still here? Uh, and for that matter, is anyone else in the audience uh, new have a ground source heat pump in their home? Or a buddy that has? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a good point. I think uh, a lot of this information is really um, uh, a lot more interesting talking to people that have practically installed these systems, the challenges they face issues with maintenance, uh, uh, replacing glycol, et cetera. So is there any other questions? Yeah. What are the pieces um, of the system that deteriorate in 15 years? It, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, the question is, what are the pieces that need to be replaced over 15 years? Um, um, I believe uh, the compressors are often the, the pieces that people plan for repair and replacement. Um, in fact, I know the, uh, the Alaska Sea Life Center, um, they've already budgeted, budgeted that. So looking at a full pulling off the compressors, putting new ones in, um, I believe it's a 20 year period, I believe, uh, around there. Um, I will note that it, they are a uh, little more um, specialized heat pumps in that they're targeting seawater and there's um, they're just uh, a little more technical than your average heat pump. But I believe the compressors um, is one area. Uh, glycol in the loops as well. So looking at re recharging those every probably couple years at least. Um, in some, some instances, others not. So that's another area that needs to be recharged is the actual working fluid in the ground loops. And then the other parts are just your standard uh, mechanical system, electrical s systems. Yeah. Well, from what you just said, is it fair to um, assume that the, uh, the actual uh, coils that are in the ground are pretty much considered, are service usable and uh, have a long service life beyond the 15 years? Like that's something that makes the compensation uh, you know, workable for quite a while? Um, I don't believe, yeah, so the question is, uh, so the coils or the loop in the ground, is that something that's long term? Can you count on that? Any issues with that? I don't believe in any of the studies we looked at there was any mention or issue with the ground loops themselves. I guess I would assume like earthquakes or other catastrophic events would of course affect those loops and then it would be really expensive to dig those up and replace them. Um, but nothing that was mentioned in particular from installers, homeowners, or the literature that I know of. Uh, potentially, depending on yeah other issues. The uh, typically, I believe the piping is HDP, so high density polyethylene, um, so pretty industrial grade uh, material. I guess, to my understanding, there's there's some issues you need to look after in terms of um, quality of installation. You know, when you're when you're building these, you know, ground loops, they're site built, and if your installer, you know, you're fusing ends together, and if you have the right tools and the person's trained on how to do it, there shouldn't be any issues with that. Uh, likewise, you should be backfilling with an appropriate material if it's, you know, one of these horizontal shallow systems. Make sure there's not something that's going to impinge on the uh, the ground loop. But if it's installed correctly, and you know, you also don't want to have poor thermal conductivity or connection between the pipes and the ground. So the last thing you'd want is for large voids in the backfill or for the, uh, the system to dry out. So really more it gets to, I think, the quality of installation. And I don't know if anyone really knows, but I've heard numbers like 50 years for the ground loop. Um, hard to say. I don't think any have been in the ground for 50 years. Yeah, 
Yeah, great questions. Are there any more? Yeah, I don't, I'm not really qualified to give the details on um, best practices for installation. Uh, the people in town that are trained, there's a, an accredited training body, the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association, and um, pretty much I think all the installers in the state that Jason referenced before have that um, training certification. They'd be the ones to be able to speak to the proper procedures, but you can't wet it one time and you know, assume it's going to stay wet. If it's in some kind of soil that um, is not wetted by the groundwater table, say it's not near the capillary fringe or whatever the case may be, um, there, there have been some issues, as far as I understand, with um, the ground drying out and it changing thermal characteristics. But um, if you're interested to really know more details on that, I think I'd recommend talking to a certified installer. And then just a note, a specialized note on seawater-based systems, there is a lot of issue, um, not on the heat pump side, but on the uh, seawater side exchange, just due to typical corrosion from seawater, perhaps uh, biofouling, other issues. But those are pretty rare, specialized cases. Yeah, sir. Yeah, so the general comment uh, being uh, perhaps a disparity between uh, suburban applications, more rural applications, and urban applications, perhaps issues, uh, solar gain, uh, uh, different uh, groundwater table characteristics of urban environments. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I think it gets to the heart of uh, applicability is a very site-dependent issue. So soil issues in one location vary perhaps drastically from other locations. I, I will say though, um, urban, suburban disparity, it's not as intuitive. I think um, typically in more urban environments, your site or land or home, it's, it's, it's a lot more limited. So your ability to install horizontal systems, uh, therefore, is a lot more limited. So for instance, in Juneau, uh, vertical systems um, are perhaps uh, the needed or typical application. But it is true that um, wherever you're at, it's going to be different. In fact, uh, Juno is a really good example where their COPs, I think, vary drastically just given their um, water their water table characteristics. Um, but uh, yeah, there are a lot of these variables between site and location. So. So Adam needs to do a movie here. Yeah. So it takes more questions Yeah, let's, yeah. Yeah, so the comment is uh, in New England, for instance, there's a lot of open loop systems taking advantage of some of these water, char water table characteristics. Um, one thing to note, in Alaska, um, there are um, limitations on discharge in open loop systems. I believe it has to be specially permitted uh, through DNR, I believe. Um, is that correct? DEC, right? Right. Right, so there are just a little, little bit more hurdles to go through for the open loop systems. Yeah, last question. No. 
The question was for the Weller install, did we look at the water table? Weller is pretty high on the, the hill up there, and the ground is very dry, actually, and it's fractured schist. We uh, were working with what we had, the space we had, and we'll see how it goes. It is a south-facing slope, so 